Welcome to Liberty Action Alert with Greg Seltz, sponsored by our friends at the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty here in Washington, D.C., a program that cuts through the chaos and confusion in the culture today by talking to kingdom citizenship, bold biblical principles for a robust public Christian life. And now your host, Dr. Greg Seltz. Good day, good day, Washington, D.C., and friends of the program all across the country. I'm Greg Seltz. Welcome to Liberty Action Alert. Today in our program, uh, we are privileged to have from one of our good friends, Alliance Defending Freedom, Julie Marie Blake. Julie serves as Senior Counsel for Regulatory Litigation at ADF, and also Tim Gegline, VP of Government Communications for Focus on the Family. Julie, Tim, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's really a joy to be here. Thanks, Greg. All right, let me set this up. And I I hate to have to set this up, but abortion, abortion, abortion. It is everywhere. I was on on the Hill these last couple of days, and almost everything we were talking about was this intrusion of an aggressive, aggressive abortion policy into every aspect of life. And I remember, you know, remember when uh, the secularists used to tell us, we just want it safe legal and rare uh no now they want it everywhere for everyone at any time Uh, just to give you an example of some of this i was in a meeting where we were talking about government is trying to actually make abortion pills uh by mail legal and they're taking away all of the regulations they're taking away all of the protections your 16 year old can can get it from the ups store from the fedex store and from uh the post ser- postal service and so suddenly we're, we're trying to make these abortion dispensaries then i talked to some folks about the military and how they're they're going to make the military fund this kind of things will commanders now become complicit in in this it's it's incredible and today we're talking about adf fighting the biden hhs provision that will make the employer again respond responsible to pay for this, among other things. So it's against common sense, women, men, family, society, but the breadth of this kind of fight now is amazing. So Julie, can you explain in more detail, first, this uh, HHS fight that we have, that you that actually you have, comment on this, the legalities of where we are, and what really is at stake? Well, For the last decade or more, the federal government, starting in the Obama administration, has been trying to make every employer uh, pay for all of their female employees, FDA-approved contraceptives, including ones that aren't actually contraceptives but can act as abortifacients, that is, very early abortion drugs. And uh, the Trump administration realized that this violated religious freedom, looked at all the lawsuits uh, over this under religious freedom, and put religious exemptions in place. Uh, the Biden administration, however, is reversing course, trying to go back to the Obama rules. President Biden campaigned on this. And so first of all, he says, look, to the extent there was a moral exemption just for pro-life people, that's out, that's going. And that's wrong. And we are standing up to HHS right now saying, don't remove that. You're going to hurt people. and You're just going to invite more lawsuits because that violates the freedom uh, under the First Amendment of pro-lifers broadly and generally. Wow. And then they're also still considering getting rid of the religious exemptions too. They're just like, ah, oh, we haven't made up our mind yet whether we're getting the religious exemptions. People have a religious objection to either contraceptives or just uh, to uh, abortifacients, uh, very early uh, abortion drugs. And um, th- that's that's just wrong. That's ignoring a lot of court orders, a lot of Supreme Court opinions. Yeah, what was the major opinion that, again, the Hobby Lobby case, this is where our people struggle because it's like, well, didn't we decide that? And then here, this administration says, we don't care what the decision is. And sometimes in some of the meetings I've been at, they know they're fundamentally going against the spirit, if not the letter of the law. And it's like, well, sue us. Uh, is is that see that we we can't wrap our minds around that kind of way of doing things in government? You know, it really reflects an erosion of norms in the legal culture. It really reflects a change um, brought on under the Obama administration. You know, rather than the government having sort of a good faith effort to comply, follow laws, not change things back and forth, th- it changed. When President Obama couldn't get his agenda through Congress, he said he had a pen and a phone. And by that, he meant he's wow. just going to order things and call bureaucrats and tell them to do things. And that, unfortunately, seems to have become the new norm. 
And the new administrative state, these bureaucrats, these agencies that aren't accountable to anyone, uh, just see what they can do. And until a court stops them, they'll keep doing it. And even when a court stops them, they'll try and come up with a new creative way to do that. It, it's an existential uh, threat to religious liberty, to the sanctity of life, parental rights, and, and so much more right now. Wow, I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write on that, a pen and a form. Because our, our people don't think this is happening. In fact, Tim, let's talk about that. Because sure. I remember when they were saying, you know, uh, Pres- or Trump is a fascist. They were saying these kind of things. I was like, what do you mean by that? Well, he's doing all these executive orders. And I said, well, the executive orders are actually reversing executive orders that took away our freedom. So I don't know how that's fascism. But anyway, but when you actually right uh, and you actually lead against the public will against moral common sense we need to speak up about this that's a that's a renegade leadership in washington dc hyde amendment you know don't use our tax money and then you see them actually saying no we're going to actually spend your tax money on this uh talk about how our people need to understand they have a role to play in being the moral voice that says no you're out of bounds This is not for you to do. And why aren't we actually rising to that occasion, do you think? Well, if I may, I think those are all three very important points. And if I can ring the bell backwards, I'll start with three, then go to two and one. Uh, And I really and I, I really strongly, very strongly agree with the narrative, the golden narrative that 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 Julie so eloquently shared with us. Point one, you know, uh, Justice Alito in a related but sometimes forgotten, very important opinion, he talked about, and I might even say, warned us of what he called the new orthodoxy. And the new orthodoxy was essentially, you know, a post-constitutional view. One view, the standard view, the view of the founders, is that the Constitution had a fixed meaning, that people uh, who can read and comprehend know what the words mean, and therefore they know what the Constitution means. But the new orthodoxy was a was a flouting of norms. It was, a, a, you know, a kind of new transgressivism that had been meshed into the, supposedly to, to the Constitution. And point two uh, is that conscience and religious liberty matter. The, the primary architect of the United States Constitution was James Madison. And he famously said that conscience is the most sacred of all property. I mean, think about that. Uh, and now point three, we have arrived at a moment in, in American uh, jurisprudence and at a moment in public policy making where the chief executive of the United States and one third of our, of, of, of our federal government believe that they can impose their will against the thing that makes America, America, which is religious liberty. Without religious liberty and conscience rights, we do not have the United States. We have something else. And I think that this kind of flouting uh, of basic norms, that you know, constitutional uh, norms, is the thing, the very thing, to Julie's overall point, that uh, eventually roots the ideas of skepticism and cynicism about the whole project of the federal government. And so I think it is very precisely on these uh, cases the ADF has so courageously uh, undertaken really that 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 you're representing all of us why they matter so deeply uh, and why frankly ADF must prevail and I'll say as an inveterate optimist I believe that they will prevail uh, because uh, ultimately this is about constitutionally protected religious liberty and it's the place where it interacts and intersects most directly in, in both instances with the sanctity and the dignity of human life. Yeah, I agree with all. And Julie, back to you then. When we think about this, sometimes as as citizens, we're, we feel a little bit helpless. We're, we're glad you're fighting for us. So the first thing is, how goes the litigation? Maybe give us a broader perspective of the things you're fighting. But then we can comment on these things too. We can, when when they start to change the view of sex in these regulatory agencies or things, we as citizens can comment on this and say w- no, uh, and and maybe we it doesn't have to get to the uh, litigation perspective. Tell us again some of the things that you're doing, but then some of the things we too as citizens can do so that this craziness at least gets put back in Pandora's box. Thank you so much for the kind words. You know, at, at Alliance Funding Freedom, um, we're focusing 
on not just what's happening across the country, but what's coming out of Washington with uh, the Biden administration, where it promised a whole of government approach to its equity agenda. And uh, what they've explained that that really means uh, two things. Uh, one, trying to undo the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs that was a pro-life victory, trying to take the issue of abortion away from the people, imposing it, federalizing it from agency bureaucrats. And then the other thing they're trying to do is to redefine federal civil rights laws, laws that were designed to create equal opportunities for women and girls, particularly in education, and instead transforming them by adding terms sexual orientation and gender identity instead. And that creates a whole host of troubles, particularly by um, taking away the opportunity for women in education to have privacy and dignity, uh, as well as opportunities to play on athletic teams. And that's actually one thing that people can vo- sound off, right, uh, express their voice on right now. The Biden administration has proposed a new rule governing sports in all of education from kindergarten through college right. and getting rid of the ability of states, cities, public schools, charter schools, anyone who gets federal funding to preserve their ability to have separate teams for women and men. And you can go online right now and comment on this sports rule anonymously, or put all your information down and and tell the Biden administration why it hurts you, why women's athletic opportunities are important, why women should have privacy in um, private spaces why women should not be forced to undress in front of men in locker rooms, other situations like that, shared showers and sports, and and tell the Biden administration right now they're taking comments uh, for about the next 30 days on that precise issue. Julie, let me just jump in. If you want to do that, you just need to go to regulations.gov, www.regulations.gov, and then check off proposed rule and last 90 days, And then you can also, I would just check off the two agencies that always seem to be the problem are the Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services. Okay, so www.regulations.gov. Okay, what else have we learned? You know, unfortunately, we've also learned that even when um, they get a flood of comments from the public saying how unpopular their agenda is, uh, sometimes they go ahead and do that anyway. And right. that's why at Alliance Spending Freedom, we sometimes, you know, regrettably have to stand for freedom in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. And we're doing that now on as many of these high profile, really important, critical issues that we can, particularly on abortion and on the opportunities to protect women's uh, equal opportunities, privacy and safety. Yeah. And, and I, we're going to try to get some links up where people can go, because I heard yesterday that what they're actually doing with, uh, like when you talked about the transgender stuff and, and the sports, is they're going to give exemptions that you, you have to actually call them up and ask, can we get an exemption? Because they're not going to let you just categorically say, no, we're going to keep women and men's sports to, uh, apart from each other. But what was amazing is when they said you can get a, an exemption at the collegiate level and at the high school level, but there are no exemptions at the grades at the grade school level, which is where everyone is so animated about these issues. And again, it just shows again, uh, tone deafness to the way people actually think about these things, their children, education, all these kinds of things. So, Tim, Glenn, Glenn Grothman is a guy that, you know, one of our uh, congressmen on the Hill. And every time I run into him on the Hill, he says, you got to tell these pastors to start speaking about this stuff. You know, we're at a point now that somehow we've been browbeaten as Christians and as even as pastoral leaders to like, this is too political. No, these are moral issues that are fundamental both to the preaching of yeah. law and gospel, but also right. to society. Society can unravel if suddenly we're actually legislating against the laws of God. So there are no, there is no middle ground on some of these issues. There's no middle ground really on is life sacred or not? Is it male, female or not? And right. if you don't preach that, I, and that doesn't mean there's not repentance and all kinds of different things of applying it personally, but as a society, once, right. once you go past this Rubicon, I mean, society itself is is actually gone. So talk about how our people, yeah. we have this moral voice that is supposed to be a, a preserving, beautiful voice for the sake of our culture, not just for our sake. It's time that we start to actually use that service for the sake of others. You know, uh, th- this is incredibly timely. And going back, if I may, to the first thing you asked Julie and her first response, I am just back uh, from a very important trip, actually, to the Southwest. And 
was uh, involved in behalf of Focus on the Family in a couple of university speeches and debates uh, with people who fundamentally disagree with our worldview. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and a very important kind of hinge moment came in one of these debates where a man uh, stood up and he said, can someone just explain to me in the king's English, that was the phrase he used, <laughs> what the issue here? Can someone just synthesize what the issue is? And right. I think this relates to your uh, question, uh, Greg. So what is the role of churches here? Uh, What I said to this man is the following. I said, forget the Democratic Party, forget the Republican Party. Do you believe that the federal government can force employers to violate their faith? Do you think they can? Now, you know, in this sea uh, of people, everyone, of course, said no. And the reason I'm suggesting this as a response to what you're saying is that very often and rightfully, especially here in Washington, we get very caught up in the public policy arguments. We get caught up in the very important hairpin curves in the law. But when we move outside the beltway and we are connecting with our fellow citizens, I think it's very important to keep this clear as crystal. In fact, I think unflinching clarity uh, is the kind of service we do to people who otherwise are very busy uh, raising their children, living their lives, many families working two and three jobs just to pay the mortgage, and they have to put up with this sea of social and cultural issues that really are impacting their sons and daughters. So I think it's very important uh, elementally that we say that in the United States of America, you cannot force employers to violate their faith, and that that's the issue And it's directly how uh, ADF is leading with so many other coalition groups and ministries in that vanguard, encouraging the administration to do the right thing. Well, that's how I say it to us. And no matter what your view of marriage is, no matter what your view of abortion is, the, the question we're asking today is what's the state's role in this and what's the federal government's role in this? And, yes. and when you say it that way, people go, oh, well, yeah, they shouldn't be doing that. I mean, we can disagree about this. We can argue about this, but they shouldn't be forcing you to do this or forcing you to do that. But again, they euphemistically don't let us talk that way. And well, behind the it, scenes, they write laws that don't allow us to actually speak about such things. Yeah, <laughs> so. no, I think that's right. And just very briefly, Uh, On point two, if I may, I think that what we have to do is explain elementally to people that illegally approving chemical abortion drugs, which is, you know, what the FDA did, that in the United States, you just can't do this and get away with it, (laughs) you know? And I think ADF has made that very clear. And I think it's why they're going to ultimately prevail uh, in this case. These issues, in other words, go together. Right. And again, uh, Julie, we, we, you've got so much precedent, whether it's legally, you've got policy that the Hyde Amendment, things like that. Every Most people I talk to go, well, no, we shouldn't have taxpayer money going to abortions. Uh, no, we shouldn't force our girls to receive biological men in the in the locker rooms. Everyone, if you just explain it so elementally and then you look at at the law and the precedent and and even the, league, the, the, the Supreme Court rulings on a lot of these things, everyone thinks it's kind of... S- already solved why why are we actually doing this again again explain why i know you just said it but i think our people need to hear it again sometimes the government says but we're going to do it anyway but let our people know this is this is serious business because um this could radically transform who we are as a people you know that that's right what you're seeing is because the country is divided and things aren't getting passed in congress you know the president feels that he's got a, a mission an ideological uh approach that he wants to apply to all of the government. And he's just not waiting for laws to be passed and the people to agree and give consensus and support to things. And that's that's why agencies are acting so lawlessly is because they're just politically emboldened um, with their agenda, call it equity or whatever they want. And they're they're going ahead um, without having the democratic process that builds support, builds consensus, brings people together. And so then it's not a surprise them what they're doing is highly divisive and it uh, targets huge parts of the country. That's what they've done, for example, on women's sports. You've had so many states pass laws protecting the opportunities for female athletes with right. save women's sports laws. And now you've got the president saying, hey, you know, 30 days from now, I, I might just get rid of all of those opportunities for women to have equal opportunities and have their privacy and dignity respected, have an equal opportunity 
to experience the thrill of victory in mm-hmm. athletics. All of a sudden, no congressional action, no no people voting on this just because we want to do it. And it, it might seem like, well, that that's a small thing with athletics. Well, it's obviously a big thing for each female athlete, right. um, but it's it's particularly important on so many issues for women in particular right now. When it comes to chemical abortion drugs, that's just been an ongoing scandal. The FDA has responsibility to protect the health, the safety and welfare of all Americans. But instead, it approved chemical abortion drugs drugs that are dangerous and that the FDA never had the law or the science to approve. And that's a case ADF has going on right now. We're actually waiting on a a big decision from the Supreme Court about whether the FDA can jeopardize all of the physical and emotional qualities uh, that that women should have protected by their doctors by allowing these drugs uh, to be mailed. You know, it used to be that you could only have surgical abortions. You go to an abortion clinic in person. Mm-hmm. But in order to to federalize the issue, the FDA is allowing these pills to be mailed, given out at every pharmacy, every Walgreens, just online. No doctor required, no exam required, no ultrasound required, no, no follow-up care at all required for these women. The, the, these are really harmful things that, that hurt people. And um, the agencies are just acting lawlessly. And when they act lawlessly, they need to be held to account in court. And that's what we're doing. Well, and they use the emergency provision, like we need this drug so badly because people are dying. And the reality is they're using the drug to actually kill innocent children. It it just defies not only common sense, it defies common morality. Um, again, how can we, Julie, how can we be supportive of you and, and the work that you do so that you're, we amplify your voice? Well, number one is always prayer. Always pray for the the, the welfare of um, ADF's clients, ADF's cases, the judges hearing our case. Also pray for the the politicians in charge, both sides of the aisle, the bureaucrats doing this, the lawyers on the other side. We always want to be trying to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and, and direct us and everything. Uh, but secondly, ADF's website, adflegal.org, is a great resource. Some of the most important things you can do are just become informed, be, be engaged, know what's going on, know what the issues are, and understand how what the Biden administration is doing really is harming lots of regular people. And you can see then how many regular people are standing up, going together, doctors, nurses, colleges, schools, regular people going to court and standing for freedom in this moment. And Tim, in terms of our work together, we just got to keep informing our people and and tell them that they have a a role to play. This is a godly role to play because preserving the culture is a beautiful thing. It's hard to share the gospel if the culture is imploding or if you have a failed state and everyone's running for their lives, right? Uh, The answer is yes. And and I think this is a very important note to close on. Even apart from the substance and content of everything that Julie has shared with us, I think there is a, 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 a actually an equally important issue with ADF, focus on the family, the Lutheran Center, even apart from the content and substance of marriage, family, parenting, human life, all the things we've talked about. And it's something that one of Julie's colleagues, uh, Aaron Hawley, said, I think with uh, a great eloquent pen, when she said that the FDA should have to answer for the damage it has done to the rule of law. That's that's not incidental here. It's central. It's mm-hmm. not just the content and substance of the agenda, you know, that the administration it's, it is pushing, but it is ultimately the damage that is done to the rule of law. This is the United States of America. This is not a banana republic. We have the rule of law given to us, concretized in our great constitution. And if you damage the rule of law, and if you're a government agency, then you have to answer for it. And I think that that's uh, not a sidebar in uh, in these massively important cases. To that end, Julie, uh, God bless. And, and, you know, we're, we're behind you all the way. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. And thanks, Tim. A pleasure. God bless. And to everyone, keep the faith and get to work. Thanks for tuning in today. To get to know our LCRL DC work better, check out our website at lcrlfreedom.org. Or check out our weekly Word from the Center opinion piece every Friday at facebook.com forward slash lcrlfreedom. Till next time, God bless you always. I'm Greg Seltz. Have a great week. You've been listening to Liberty Action Alert with Greg Seltz. 
Executive Director of the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C. This program has been brought to you by the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty.